gentlemen, buonasera, and welcome to the Cohasit Italian Family History Group May 29th event. I'm Ron Seggi from Universal Studios, Florida. Tonight, we have a very special evening in store with our featured guest speaker, Dr. Ann Rogerson from the University of Sydney, Faculty of Arts and Social Science Department of Classics and Ancient History, lecturer in Latin studies. Please take your seats and please take a moment to turn off your mobile phones. Enjoy the evening. <laughs> This year, um, in 2014, we have a really, really good lineup um, of uh, some of the events coming up. But we won't actually be holding one in June this year because, because we have a featured guest speaker in July. So we're taking a break in June and, and we'll be back in July. And um, so the lineup is looking pretty good. Uh, for July, we have um, Antonio Zeckelin from Palace Cinemas, who's coming to speak. That's on the 23rd of July. August, we have an author named Gabriella Della Vedova Conti, who's talking about a book that she, she wrote on the wings of the rainbow. It's really quite interesting. September, we have um, uh, Frank, Frank Caruso, who um, is the uh, uh, sort of natural health guru. So it should be a fun talk. Joe Abati, we have uh, in October, which should even be a, you know, a heck of a lot of fun. I think he's a, he's a wonderful entertainer. We just saw him last week, and uh, he's, he's very much looking forward to the, the event in October. And in November, we have a gentleman that's coming who has done a lot of research on um, migrants from Sicilia, from Sicily, uh, in the 50s and 60s. And he's actually done a lot of research on the music that those migrants brought to Australia and a lot of the other um, sort of artifacts and, and you know, family stories. And he's going to show some rare documentaries. So I think it could be uh, a very interesting event. Next year, we've already lined up a couple of really interesting speakers. In February, I have um, the president of New Italy uh, from the Lisbon area that's, that's actually coming to be one of our guest speakers, so that'll be fun. And um, also just secured the editor-in-chief of a, of a magazine called Italianicious, which is uh, actually published uh, by a company called Prime Media in Melbourne, so she's coming to speak. And I'm sure we'll fill the other months up as we get closer to the time. But anyway, so it's starting to uh, sort of fill up. Um, we uh, actually have a really interesting uh, guest speaker tonight, as you're aware, because you got the flyer, Dr. Ann Rogerson that's sitting over here, who is um, the Charles Tesoriero uh, lecturer in, in Latin at the University of Sydney. So uh, very, very much looking forward to her talk. She's going to be talking about, um, um, uh, well, basically the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in Pompeii in 79 AD, and um, uh, the eyewitness accounts and stories by um, a gentleman named Pliny. Is that right? Yeah. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, the talk. So, I'll, I'll get through this so we can actually get to the real nuts and bolts of the, of the evening. Um, 
This year we actually made a few new changes. We have a new uh, policy government uh, a governance document uh, that's almost in place with Coasit, um, which is just going to help you know formulate the group a lot better. And we're going to actually sort of initiate a new concept, which is a membership fee as of July this year, which will just be five dollars a year for everybody um, that actually wants to become a member, just to help support the group. Um, and we have to do it this way because of the type of, of uh, sort of policy document that we're actually doing with Coasit. So it just makes it a bit more official. Of course. People don't have to become a member to actually come to these events, but but if you become a member for the five dollars a year, what happens? You come to the AGM and you have full voting rights. So it's just one of those sort of membership situations. So anybody that's interested, um, if if you're on our database, you'll be receiving this information probably on the, the third week of, of June. So uh, we encourage membership for you know, for a few reasons, just to help support the group. So so thank you. Yeah. Um, also this year, our secretary and treasurer, Maria Linders, is sitting here in the front, um, actually is just starting a whole new situation that um, about six times a year, seven times a year, she's holding um, these special uh, small group sessions on a Saturday afternoon, about one o'clock. And the first one that she's holding is actually this Saturday here at the forum. And um, she's going to be helping people with um, a certain websites that one can go to to actually um, trace their, their roots you know, sort of more effectively and sort of how to document your family tree, which is really, really important for a lot of reasons. One, one reason is because when we're gone, of course, it's, it's, absolutely, it's absolutely crucial. It's probably my phone, actually. No, it's not. But actually, I didn't turn my phone off, so I'll turn it off. It wasn't mine, I promise. Um, but it's they're very important to actually document your family history because because when we go, you know, I mean, our children will know what's happening. So, so that's what the group's all about. We certainly encourage that, and um, we want to try and help people with, with that way forward. So that's what uh, Maria's going to be doing on the on the Saturday afternoons. And there's an event this Saturday at one o'clock. So at the end of the session, anybody that's interested, please just, just come and see Maria. Who's sitting in the front row? She'll be wandering around. And. Uh, I'll put your name down. We're actually very, very uh, um, flattered, I guess the word is, Maria, yeah, because um, we, I mean, our database has increased quite a bit, uh, I guess, since December, January. You know, we, we're probably up to about six, 620 people on our database. Um, gosh, I hope we have that much in, in terms of membership. We'll, you know, we can buy this place. Uh, but um, um, now the thing about it is uh, that uh, we, a sort of outreach farther than Sydney, of course, with our database, and we have two people that are actually flying in just for this event um, on Saturday. We have one person that's flying in, um, I think her name is Narita, someone who's actually flying in from the Gold Coast to actually come to the Maria session, which is great. And um, we just found out that we have somebody else flying up from Melbourne as well, so uh, it's just amazing, really, that that's actually happening. So uh, congratulations, Maria, for actually getting all this happening. I think it's really... Uh, Fantastic for the group. Thanks for all the work. Um, and um, also, we're really, really happy the Italian Family History Group have been invited to be uh, a guest speaker um, ourselves at Italian Week in Brisbane, which is this Saturday. So they're flying myself up and also Fabian Moschiava, who is one of our founding members. He was a committee member. And um, so we have an hour session on Saturday in Brisbane at the Treasury Casino. Um, God help us at the casino. Yeah. Um, but uh, so I'll be talking a little bit, uh, right? I mean, about Coaz and a little bit about our group for 10 minutes. Bertie asked me to come and play a couple selections, so I will. And then uh, Fabian has a good 40 minutes where he's talking about the exact same things that Maria's doing here. So we have a you know sort of stereo thing happening between here and and, and Brisbane, which is fantastic for the group. So we're we're in two places at the same time, actually at the same time because our starts at 12, and your starts at one. So so. If there's any information I can pass to you, we'll call you. <laughs> so anyway, so yeah, we're really, really quite excited about this. So, so it's great. Um, ironically enough, um, our lovely guest speaker tonight, Dr. Amber Rogerson, um, when when the organizer of, of Italian League Brisbane found out because he looked at our site, um, what we're doing, and he found out that she was one of our guest speakers this week, he called me right away and said, he said, Art, is there any chance that you can put me in touch with Dr. Amber Rogerson because we're filming, we're screening a film on Pompeii at 2.30 on the Saturday, and we'd love her to come up and do the same talk that she's doing here, so, so they're flying Dr. Ann up as well. So it's a win-win situation, really, for, for the, uh, the group, so I'm really quite, quite happy about that. Um, 
just a few little sort of news tidbits. Um, um, I'm very fortunate. Um, I was in Melbourne this this week, and I had a really great meeting with the editor in chief of Italian Issues magazine because I mentioned she's speaking uh, for us in June, and she wants to do a feature article on the on the, on the Italian Family History Group in their uh, March April edition, where she's going to do a, a full page about the history of the group, what we've done, what we're doing, and the main thing that it actually interests. This magazine is that um, they actually talk about a lot of culture. Most of it's food, and music, film. They've never done anything on on how to trace your heritage, uh, your family history. So they're really, really wrapped about what we're doing because they want to actually get as much information that we can help them with, so they can put some some information, some websites in the article um, that to help people do that. So this could increase our membership as well. I hope, and I think it's just a good profile overall. So. So we're quite happy about that. Um, last time I gave a report at the AGM for, uh, for, for CORAS that they actually invited me to give a, a report, so that was uh, quite successful. It was well accepted, and um, we thank the CORAS board. I thank the general manager, Thomas Temporiali, and Sada Biella, who is the learning and business development manager for their belief in us and continued support. Um, a bit of uh, a sort of housekeeping before we actually move on. Um, when you actually arrive tonight and you pay your five dollar entry fee, um, that really just sort of helps us with uh, you know, the cost of this event and uh, with the ushers that we use, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and of course, the uh, raffle prizes. And one of the things that the ticket um, sort of allows is that at the end of the night, which is about you know, 8 40, 8 45, if I get off the stage, it'll, it'll be by then. Um, and um, we are able to use that ticket to go to a restaurant in the forum where we can actually use the ticket to actually get a free coffee or a tea or to use the ticket as a $2.50 discount on a little set menu that they have done. Um, we always use Lajar, as everybody knows. In March, they were closed, um, and we just had to actually negotiate a quick deal with someone else. So tonight, which is our last time we'll be going to this other restaurant, is called Il Sapore, which is right next to the of the jar, and they have a little menu for us. So that's where everybody is welcome to go at the end of the night. Uh, Gina and Mario at the jar are understanding about it, absolutely no problem, and they look forward to us continuing our relationship with them you know, from here on in. And they apologize that they were closed in, in March. I mean, it wasn't anybody's fault, it was just one of those things. You know? So anyway, so tonight I hope we can see everybody at Il Supporte. It'll be great. Um, uh, well, one of the things that I do um, because I want to try and put a little bit of Italian culture and passion, you know, sort of into the night. Besides our guest speakers, is um, I always try and choose one one traditional Italian song which I'll, I'll play tonight. And I thought I would play a selection called um, "Arrivederci Roma," which uh, which means a goodbye Rome. And it's a really lovely piece. Uh, I'm sure you've all heard it. It was written in 1955, part of a soundtrack of an Italian. American musical um, of the same title, but it was released in the, in the English countries as um, uh, the Seven Hills of, of Rome, and it starred a uh, a young actor and, and singer named Mario Lanza. So that was a big hit by you know, Mario. And the thing that I actually love about the song is that um, and you've all been to Rome, I'm sure, and every time you leave Rome, you actually have that feeling that you know that some sad feeling that that. And you're leaving such a lovely, lovely place. And I think um, that my grandparents in particular, and, and also your grandparents, when they left Italy in the, in the 50s or the early 1900s, like my grandparents did, I think that they went through a lot of these feelings that this a piece of music actually sort of evokes, you know? Because it's sort of a heart-tugging and a sort of a happy, sad uh, piece. So you know, I just thought I would play one selection for you. Arrivederci Roma.
And um, that's one of the other things that we'd like to do is actually sort of inform people of um, some new book publications, new DVDs that are available. And I just wanted to sort of um, I'll show you two things real quick. There's a, uh, a lovely DVD that I just got from a producer in Melbourne that I know called Ligon Street, Si Parla Italiano, which means we speak Italiano. Yeah? And um, it's a three set a DVD, and it's all about the history of uh, Ligon Street in Melbourne. It's really, really quite an interesting uh, piece. So, uh, so that's one for sure. And there's a DVD that Dominic, um, our past chairman, uh, Dominic Olivero, has actually introduced us to, which is called Visions. And it's, it's also a three DVD set. And where there's one of the north, one of the south, and one of Sicilia, yeah, which is quite nice. And that's what you were looking at when you walked in. Um, and uh, one of our guest speakers that we have coming up in August uh, actually authored this book called Sulle Ali del Arco Beldeno, which means On the Wings of the Rainbow. It's a really a beautiful book. It's uh, sort of her family story uh, and about the struggles that she went through and how her great great grandfather lost their home in Italy, and um, uh, the next generation actually accidentally bought the same house without knowing it. So it, you know, it came full, full circle. So she's coming to speak for us uh, then. And the magazine that I was talking about, uh, where uh, Daniela Gallucci is the uh, editor in chief that's coming to speak for us, that's, that, that's doing the article, is called Italian Issues. And it's really, really fantastic because there's all these lovely uh, recipes and stories about Italians in there. Um, Last but not least, the Italian Family History Group recently just printed these new um, uh, leaflets and four generation charts. We updated them on, on the back. It, it looks like what the group had before, but they're just sort of updated. I think you all got that at the front, front table. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, so, a coincidence actually approached the Italian Family History Group a couple weeks ago about a project that they are actually developing as a resource for carers and aged care service providers. Um, it's, it's to aid the reminiscence with older Italians, particularly those right, that are living with dementia. Um, it's called the Memory Box Project. And it's really, really quite interesting. And it's actually headed up by a lovely lady named Pina Leyland, that's sitting over here that I'm gonna ask up in a minute from Coraset, and um, she works in aged care services under the supervision under the supervision of Maria Angelato, uh, who's a team leader of counseling and, and community development at Coraset. That's all fantastic. And um, uh, so it's really something that I thought we could get a little bit involved with. Um, uh, Peter's gonna come up and talk for about uh, so sort of 10 minutes to explain the project and really what we want to do is to see if, if any of our group has some ideas and if so, you know, uh, the subpoena will explain actually how to get in touch with her. Um, it's really important, I think, for, for you know, sort of, all, you know, actually older people to, to have something to grab on, to some sort of a memory, you know? And that's really what the project is all about. So I just want to bring Pina up to have a chat with her. Thank you. It should be on there. Testing, testing. Testing, testing. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> okay. Over to you. Uh, so, so people like that, everybody. Um, ah, if that's not my speech. <laughs> oh, no, no, I mean, it was just, it was just <laughs> the intro. That's okay, that's my intro then. So, um, uh, Coasset Community Services has been working on this project for um, a few weeks now, a uh, few months, and also with uh, Lucy Merritt, um, my outsider who was sitting there. She's, oh, she's in front now. Um, so um, this project is um, it's part of a range of uh, tools that we're developing to help carers, and it's uh, something that's wanted by the Australian government. They're putting money into this. Um, they're looking at um, uh, culturally specific resources. So Alzheimer's Australia, they're developing resources which are mainstream and we're taking some of their ideas and adapting them for uh, our communities, in, in our case, the Italian community. 
Um, and the purpose of me being here is to tell you about it as part of the consultation process, also to get any ideas and feedback. If you think it's a dumb idea, we'd like to hear that. If you think it's a good idea, we'd like to hear that. Um, and also maybe some assistance because it's, um, it's quite expensive to go sourcing all the items that we want for these boxes. Ideally, each um, older person that needs one of these would have their own specific box that's tailored to their own experience and interests. The family would do it for them. But there are lots of instances where people don't have that. And what we want to do is create a generic one, a prototype that we can say, this is the kind of thing you could put together and might help the person that you're caring for, whether it's in the community or um, in the family um, or in a nursing home. Okay, so, uh, so the target group is that wave of migrants that came post Second World War um, and their memories are going back to early childhood and early, oh, childhood and early adulthood. So we're looking at resources that fit with the 1940s to 1960s, so um, objects and images from that time that might spark memories. And um, this is all part of reminiscence therapy, which is used with people that are lose, losing memory and have dementia. So it's, a, it's actually you know, a tried and tested strategy. It's not something we're pulling out of the hat. Um, Alzheimer's Australia have um, what they call, they call it a fiddle box. Um, which is a box you give to someone and they can sort of, um, you know, touch, it's very tactile. Uh, we found it was um, a little bit um, geared to females because it had fabric and cottons and wool and knitting needles, things like that in it, and we have those too. Um, but we thought maybe there needed to be some more male-oriented, male, uh, male uh, what do you call it? <laughs> Male-specific, that's the word. Um, uh, they also, they're, they're adapting Montessori education principles, which is interesting for us because the Casa d'Italia, where Calvazit is now based, <coughs> um, half of the building, or some, not half, maybe, I don't know how much, half of the building is being leased to a Montessori school. So it's interesting that there's this overlap now. Anyway, uh, Alzheimer's Australia are using Montessori education principles to develop this idea, and they're suggesting that um, using the senses, targeting the senses is helpful. So there are things in these boxes that try and address that. So, you know, touch, taste, smell, sound. What have I missed? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay, so we we started off with one box. We've now got one that's more male for males. The other is more for females. There's a crossing over, um, of course. There are some things that are good for everyone, like there's the taste and um, smell ones. Um, but we're looking for items that are particularly Italian. Um, things that are expensive to buy, if anyone has them and willing to donate. Um, small items that w would evoke memories. And the kinds of things we're thinking of is car emblems, badges, like fiat badges, uh, statues of Mary, Jesus, the saints, prayer cards. We've got some rosary beads, but rosary beads are always good. And it's been suggested that anything to do with tailoring or even shoemaking might be useful in here. So I've got a list of stuff that's already in here. I've got handouts if anyone's interested. There's a list if, you, if anyone is interested in participating in this or contributing, if you want to put your contact details down there. I've also got my business card. Uh, now I do have something to say about that. I'm actually leaving Coazit to go to Canberra and work for FECA which is the Federation of Ethnic Communities Councils of Australia. So I'm going to be doing this, what I do for Italians, on a broader stage. But all my emails are going to go to Maria Angelados. So if you want to take a business card, then the name, the, t the contact details, all this, well, you, your message will get through. Um, Lucy will be following through with this project as well. Um, it's being, tr it's being um, taken to a broader scale in southwest Sydney. There's a forum on the 13th of June, which is multicultural, so there's about 10 different ethnic organisations that are all developing a culturally specific memory box for display, and all of the um, nursing homes um, commu and community providers, care providers as well, they're all being invited to come. So they'll be seeing a whole range of these memory boxes, including ours. Uh, that's it, I think. So, so you want to show one of the examples of the uh, Okay. Um, 
So I think the female one. So the kinds of things we've got in here, uh, we're just experimenting still. They need to, these images need to be bigger um, and they need to be in colour, but we've got sort of prayer cards, it really just, oops, imagery. Um, there's more prayer cards in here. So they're very sort of evocative. Um, bits of lace, crochet, we've got some images of food that you know we can use as a basis for asking questions and discussing like do you like this, do you like that thing, do you remember cooking this, blah blah blah, bits of crochet, fabrics, things to touch, lots of tactile things, uh, you know the usual threads and buttons and things, some Nivea cream that was donated that's for hand massages. Um, and you know, people have been giving what they can. Someone suggested hair, hair curlers, someone else gave a little brooch. There's different things in there. So it's just a starting, a starting um, exercise. Someone else suggested that you know, having food items right. on display would be useful. That's the things that really sort of evoke the five senses yeah. that they can actually sort of that's relate it. to, you know. That's uh, it. So anything to sell. Uh, yeah, and in the male one, there's actually samples, samples of herbs and spices um, and tools, things to hold, keys. Um, yeah. Well, that's great. I've so got a list. <laughs> I won't yeah. run through the list. I'll be here all night. So I guess what we're looking for is, you know, and, Actually, anybody that's interested, if you have any ideas, um, you know, please sign up and actually get in touch with Pina via the email address on the, on the business card. But concept ideas would really, really help, right? And if anybody has any ideas of what, what they could include in the box or even anything that wants to donate, I suppose would, would be uh, yeah, right. um, something beneficial. I mean, I think it's a really, really lovely project. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's absolutely important because, because they need to have something to, you know, it's particularly, it's particularly for the older people that are isolated, they're in mainstream yeah. uh, centres and there's nothing Italian there for them. Yeah, right, right. So it's giving the centres an idea of what they can yeah. provide. It's a fantastic idea, it's sort of, and it was Peter's idea. Yeah, so we really... Oh, I've got it from outside of Australia, so... Yeah, it's a great sort of, you've got a round of people, you know. <laughs> and each person will have their own box. That is ideal. So yeah, uh, that's ideal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that, the ideal is for someone to have their own personal box of things that are really evocative for them. But in situations where people, you know, have, you know, don't have those connections or there isn't that history, then it would be useful to have a, a prototype, a sample to refer to. So all, all the information that um, I'm compiling and this is compiling we'll put up on the website. We have a website called Caring for Older Italians. So we're trying to um, you know, get as much information as we can together and put it up there so it's accessible for carers. Because there isn't a lot out there. And people get stuck and don't know what to do. So it's, this is just one project. There's a whole range. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant ideas. Okay, so anyone that's interested at the end of the night, Please come sign up. Yeah. Anyway, thank you. Thank you for your time. Thanks here. for your time. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, if you want. Okay. Um, so, uh, so some people might think this is a really, really, really sort of uh, a bizarre way of looking at you know Pompeii, but it was only actually less than two thousand years ago, which is one thousand nine hundred thirty-five years ago, um, is when. The horrible destruction happened. Um, and it sounds like a long, long time ago, but when you calculate this, and I wanted to make sure about these numbers, so I called Dr. Anna up a couple weeks ago and asked me, she said, I never thought about that before, but you know, it's only 58 generations ago. And that doesn't sound like a whole lot compared to 2,000 years ago, really, does it? Uh, because we worked out there's probably three generations in a 100 year period, so that's about right, yeah? Um, so anyway, so it's gonna be really a, a quite an interesting talk. Um, so, so Dr. Ann Rogerson um, is the senior lecturer there, uh, sort of in Latin studies. Af af after completing her, I have to put my glasses on for this, because um, the typeface is too small. After completing a combined degree in, in arts and science at the University of Sydney, she received a PhD at the University of Cambridge in England, worked as a lecturer at the University of Nottingham, um, and then at, at Cambridge um, for several years before returning home to Sydney. She teaches Latin language and literature studies, um, as well as literature and translation. 
Um, Anne is also a frequent contributor to um, a Wednesday slot on Richard Glover's Drive program on ABC 702, where she talks about really interesting quirks of daily life in Rome. And I just wanted to say how we got here is I was driving home, I thought it was a Friday, but maybe it was a Wednesday, and I had ABC radio on, and, and this a person was talking about all these in, interesting things. It was about Pompeii, I remember you were talking. So I, I got home and I poured myself a glass of wine and I immediately called ABC 702 and I said, can you tell me who that is that's speaking? So he told me and I, I found him the next day, didn't I? And we, we talked and I roped her in into coming in and uh, actually speaking for us. So, so without further ado, I just wanted to introduce Dr. Aaron Rogers. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you very much for the invitation to come and speak to all of you. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. And um, as I said, I want to talk about um, the destruction of Pompeii in 79 AD and some of the uh, personal stories that we have um, from that time. So the last days of Pompeii are a source of unending fascination. Um, indeed, so is Pompeii itself, right? The small city near Naples at the foot of Mount Vesuvius it was covered in ash and pumice during the eruption of 79 AD, um, preserving it for nearly 2,000 years, or if you're thinking generations, um, 58 was it? Um, until it was rediscovered um, in the 18th century. And now Pompeii itself is a tourist destination, um, and exhibitions of the objects and the bodies that were found there tour the world. Um, historians, archaeologists, anthropologists um, study all that material, and there are also countless novels um, and movies set against the dramatic backdrop of the volcano. My interest today is not in the material remains, but what the Romans themselves in the first century AD actually said about the disaster. And these are stories that give us an important insight into the culture and the beliefs of the peoples of Italy in the glory days of the Roman Empire. Um, well, they give us insight into the beliefs of some of those people anyway, um, because the wealthy and the educated um, are really the class that we, that we know the most about, um, because they're the ones who wrote all the books. Um, okay. So stories about how people react in a crisis. These are stories about ideals and about values, and there's a lot to be learned from them about what a community thinks is important in the ways that it represents human responses to disaster. So we're going to go back in time to Pompeii. The year is 79 AD. The emperor is called Titus, and Pompeii is a small but prosperous town on the coast of the Bay of Naples, um, with a population of about 20,000. It was hit by a bad earthquake about 17 years previously, um, then that was followed by an ongoing series of tremors, and not all of the damage caused by that earthquake has been repaired. Now, a strange cloud of ash rises from the mountain Vesuvius in the morning on a late summer's day, and by early afternoon, pumice is starting to fall. After several hours, in fact, so much pumice has fallen that buildings start to collapse under the weight of it. Um, people begin to flee, and many of them escape. Um, but in the early hours of the morning, then, the next day, there's a series of pyroclastic blasts that come out from the volcano, um, and they, they just blast down the mountain, and they're deadly to anything in their path. Um, and so it's the towns and settlements to the south and to the west of the mountain that are overwhelmed one by one, Herculaneum, Aplontis, Boscoriale, and of course Pompeii. Uh, and the ash and the pumice continue to fall. Eventually, um, these towns, including Pompeii and the bodies of the about 650 people that have been found there, um, are covered up in layers from anything from four meters to 60 meters thick. Um, and of those survivors who went back and tried to salvage what they could, there's an absolute wealth of material left behind, um, including, of course, the beautiful frescoes like this one from the Villa of the Mysteries. Okay. But as the first witness for my claim that um, the eruption of Vesuvius offers us insight not just into how the Romans lived, thanks to the evidence of daily life that's preserved under the ash, but how they thought they should live, um, I turn to Titus, who was the emperor of the day. 
that's what his head looked like, and it's just attached to a very heroic body, which is <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, so, um, anyway. He'd actually only been emperor for a couple of months when Vesuvius erupted, and he only lived for a few years, so he, his, um, his rule was quite short. Um, his response to the disaster is a big feature in his biography that was written by Suetonius, who wrote a series of biographies of the Roman emperors. Um, and Suetonius um, uses what Titus did after Vesuvius erupted as evidence for his extraordinary generosity and kindness. Um, and what's interesting um, is that Suetonius is stressing that Titus went above and beyond what might be expected of an emperor um, in response to such a crisis. So he personally gave aid and he acted uh, not merely like an emperor, but like a father. Um, and instead of profiting um, from, uh, by scooping up all of the property of the people who died in the disaster, he made sure that that money was used to help rebuild the communities who had suffered where possible. So one of the, the great differences between um, the Italy of about 2,000 years ago and the modern Western world is that we can expect government aid in times of crisis, but the citizens of the ancient world simply could not. Um, Roman emperors who wielded enormous political and military power and often had vast personal fortunes as well as obviously control over the money of the state, um, they might help, but they might not. It was a decision that was really up to them. And there's no mechanism in place by which the state would kind of swing into action um, no coordinated emergency services, um, no special levies to help victims of devastating floods or earthquakes or fires or volcanic eruptions. Um, so if you're lucky, and well, lucky, if something bad happens to you but there's a good emperor, kind of lucky, um, then the emperor will help. But he might not. And Nero is a case in point. He was the emperor of 62 AD. That was the year that that major earthquake I was talking about um, hit Pompeii. He was actually in Naples at the time. And one of the many stories that we get about him in the work of the historian Tacitus, which is used to illustrate um, his madness and his badness, um, is his response when the earthquake destroyed the theater in Naples that he'd been performing in um, the previous day. And everyone else, as you can see, is deeply alarmed. I think this is very sinister. Um, but Nero um, views it as a sign that the gods are looking after him, so he's okay. Um, Nero is an example of the sort of emperor that you just would not want um, on the throne in the aftermath of a disaster, because everything was about Nero for Nero. Um, and he had very little compassion for people who'd suffered. Apparently, once he visited an earthquake-stricken town and looked around um, and said, uh, yes, well, actually everyone should leave. This is pretty hopeless, this place. But there was no help for those people. Um, so the amount of aid you got from the emperor depended on the nature of the emperor um, and the, the sort of the profile of the town that you were in and the disaster that happened to you. Um, so disasters illuminate um, the characters of the Roman emperors who responded to them. Um, what about the people who actually were there, people slightly more ordinary. And this is where I want to turn to the days of the eruption itself, when we're fortunate enough to have an account from someone who was in the area at the time. And the stories that he tells are not as romantic as um, modern movie directors would have us believe, but they show us the relationships and the sorts of behaviour that were important to the Roman elite in the first century AD. Okay. So my setting is the Bay of Naples, Vesuvius looming behind it. Pompeii, I've just circled in the red there, is to the south of the mountain. Herculaneum is a little further up the coast on the way to Naples. And we are beginning at the promontory of Mycenaeum. It's at Mycenaeum that our eyewitness was living, a writer known as Pliny the Younger. And there he is. Pliny was in his teens at the time, and he was staying with his mother and his uncle, who is also called Pliny, and is known, therefore, as Pliny the Elder. Um, and the actual account comes from, was written several years later, um, where the now adult Pliny the Elder is writing a letter, this is le letter 16 in book 6, um, to his friend Tacitus, the historian. And it's the first of two letters from Pliny to Tacitus 
about the eruption. Both of them are published in book six of the collected correspondence. Um, it's important, in fact, to bear in mind that um, this is correspondence that not only was published, but was written with an eye to publication. Um, so as an eyewitness account, it's, it's a little suspect. It's perhaps as trustworthy as a politician's autobiography. Um, but it's useful nonetheless, and in my view it's useful precisely because it is an account that's deeply concerned with um, self-promotion and with the image of the people who are being written about. Okay. So as Pliny explains, his family are there at Mycenae because his uncle, Pliny the Elder, was there on an official post. He was the commander of the fleet that was based at Mycenae, um, and on the 24th of August in the afternoon, Pliny's mother pointed out that there's a strange cloud rising in the distance. The elder Pliny's initial response is to investigate. He calls for his shoes, he climbs up to where he can get the best view of this funny cloud. Um, what we see here is the start of a sustained representation of Pliny the Elder as a scientist. Um, and in fact, that's his main claim to fame. Um, he's the author of a monumental uh, 37 book encyclopedia of natural history, um, so ancient facts and theories about animals, vegetables, minerals, natural phenomena, um, and so as the author of this work, um, sensing there's a new mystery about the natural world to be unravelled, that Pliny the Elder responds to the strange phenomenon in the sky. Um, and as um, the younger Pliny says, the sight of it made the science, scientist in him determined to see it um, closer at hand. Um, no one back then um, had ever seen or heard of a mushroom cloud, but it's clear from the description that it was something very like this, this the cloud that rose from the volcano that uh, um, erupted in Iceland a few years ago. Um, okay. So spurred by scientific fervour, Pliny the Elder gets ready to set off, and he asks his nephew if he'd like to come along. Um, I prefer to study. So Pliny the Younger, luckily for him. Um, so he, he stays home and reads his book. Um, but this is the beginning um, of a depiction of the younger Pliny as well as the elder of a, as a man of letters, right, a man interested in literature and learning. We'll see more of that a little later. It's as, that he, as he's leaving um, that Pliny the Elder receives a letter from um, the wife of a friend of his, which gives him a second reason, a more pressing reason, um, to head towards the disaster. Because this woman, Rectina, is one of several people who are living along the coast, sort of in the shadow of Vesuvius, with no escape route open to them except by boat. The ash in the pumice has been falling for some time, and she's getting anxious. So Penny <coughs> decides to set up um, to help her and the others in the area. And that means that the expedition that began as a quest for knowledge now calls for courage and the scientist displays his valour. And it's valour that, we'll, as we'll see, um, takes a very particular and a very Roman form. So he launches his quadrivenes. Those are quadrivenes. Um, and he sets off. Remember, this is the man who's the commander of the fleet. Um, so when he responds, he uses those, the resources that are available to him. But he's not responding in his capacity as commander. He's responding as a private citizen. Um, and a friend. Okay. So, we talk about a quest that requires courage. Was he afraid, is the question that he then asks. He's moving against the tide of people towards danger while everyone else is fleeing, um, but we're told that he maintains an appearance of calm. Um, indeed, he keeps up his scientific observation dictating notes to a secretary, even as they are sailing down the coast towards the volcano that is belching this evil cloud of smoke. Um, and when the helmsman of the ship suggests um, that this is not looking very good, maybe we should turn back, um, he disagrees and he uh, quotes a very old proverb, Fortes fortuna uat, fortune fails the brave, he says. Um, and on they go. They land at the house of a friend who lives on the coast and, desperate to flee, has his ships ready, but they can't get away because the winds are blowing in off the sea so no one can sail away from the coast. Um, it's early evening by this point and the ash in the air is making everything dark. Pumice is falling. Everyone is terrified. 
except Pliny the Elder, um, who puts on an ostentatious <coughs> show of unconcern. So he takes a bath, um, and he thinks that if he has a bath, everyone else will feel better. Um, and then he explains that all oh, the fires that they can see on the mountain, um, that's just a couple of people who left, forgot to put their fire out before they fled from their houses, so there's no need to worry about that. Um, his every action, his nephew claims, is designed to demonstrate to the others how they should behave. And this, of course, this is Pliny, the philosopher. Um, the elder Pliny, in fact, here is representing exactly how philosophers were supposed to respond to misfortune. The ideal philosopher in the ancient world um, is, it, the ideal of the philosopher in the ancient world is just not to get upset. So you don't let a little thing like a volcano bother you, you keep your cool, um, or at least the appearance of it. And uh, for Romans, uh, for philosophical Romans, um, being seen to be philosophical and calm is, is almost as important as being philosophical and calm. So he goes to bed and is either really sleeping or pretending to sleep and snoring so everyone thinks he's asleep. Um, his nephew is impressed by this, and readers of the letter are supposed to be impressed as well. Fortitude and self-control in the face of danger, and even death, was valued very, very highly by the Romans. Eventually, though, uh, the ash and the pumice is continuing to fall. It's piled up so high outside that they have to make a decision. If they don't leave now, then they won't be able to get away. Uh, but again, the way that that Pliny tells about how the decision was taken is used to demonstrate his uncle's philosophical nature. Um, so staying is dangerous because um, people's houses are starting to collapse under the weight of the pumice. Going is dangerous um, partly because rocks are falling from the sky. But then Pliny the Younger said, but, but the rocks were only pumice and pumice is light and it's hollow and it's relatively harmless and Pliny the Elder his uncle, remember the author of the natural histories, knows all about pumice, so he knows that it's safer to go than to stay. Um, so the decision is taken to leave, um, but it's a rational decision only on the part of Pliny the Elder. Um, everyone else is just um, scared to stay, scared to go as well, but more scared to stay than to go. Anyway, they tie pillows on their heads and they set off down to the shore, to the beach, to see if the winds have shifted, and they haven't. It's here that the end comes for Pliny the Elder. And he's resting um, when the sulphur and the flames reach them. But even now, he shows his difference to the common herd. Everyone else is running around and running away. He stands up to face his death, and his death comes quickly. He collapses, overwhelmed by the noxious atmosphere. Um, so it's an appropriate death for a philosopher of his kind. Um, this part of the story too, though, is also an exercise in public relations. Now, we've seen how Pliny represents his uncle as an ideal sage, you know, philosophically facing a terrifying event. Um, we've seen him as an ideal scholar, taking notes even as he's sailing towards the eruption. And we've seen him as an ideal Roman aristocrat too, um, acting to help his friends rather than simply thinking about himself the way Nero might have done. But Pliny's doing all of this not just as a eulogy for his uncle, um, but to counter the other story that was going around, we know it was going around because it's recorded in Suetonius, that biographer, and the other story says that the elder Pliny did not face his death with detachment, um, but begged his slave to put him out of his misery. And basically help him to commit suicide. This is an ignominious death in the eyes of the Romans, much more in fact like the death of the Emperor Nero, um, whom we met earlier, than a figure whom the Romans would or even could admire. So Pliny the Younger, writing this letter about his uncle, clearly feels the need to counter this precisely this kind of suggestion, this story. It becomes clearer and clearer as we think about this, that these letters are really all about spin. Now, I turn now, and um, this is the last section of the talk, to Pliny's second letter to Tacitus, where he tells us what happened to him and to his mother who'd been left back at Mycenae. And here, too, we can very clearly see Pliny shaping 
his own image. Um, interestingly, in a slightly different way to how he presented his supremely philosophical uncle. The model here is not so much a, a stoic sage, but another kind of culture hero. And our first clue as to the model that Pliny the Younger is setting up for himself comes at the beginning of the letter with a quote from the great epic poet Virgil. Um, the mind shudders to remember, but here is the story of what happened. Now, this is what the Trojan hero Aeneas says um, as he begins the story of his escape from the city of Troy after it has been captured by the Greeks. And Aeneas, the, the legendary founder of the Roman race, um, the hero of, of Virgil's great epic, is a very important model for the younger Pliny in this second letter. So unlike um, his uncle, who manages to sleep, um, he passes a disturbed night, largely because his mother um, is upset by the fact that <laughs> there are continual earth tremors and the pumice falling from the sky, um, and she wakes him up. So they sit up together most of the night. Um, he tries to maintain an appearance of calm. So, oh, I don't know what's happened there. Anyway, he sends for a volume of Livy, um, Livy's history, and he sits there reading and taking notes all night, but obviously in emulation of his uncle's scholarly calm. Though it's also clear um, that the young man is not really as in control as he might like to appear. Um, and a friend arrives um, and urges them to leave <coughs> and says indeed that this is foolhardiness, not bravery, to sit around reading history as the world is falling apart. Um, Pliny, though, keeps on reading and taking notes. It's only at dawn that he and his mother finally decide to leave Mycenaeum. And they end up, um, the way Pliny tells the story, at the head of a small crowd. Um, lead, and he's leading a, ba a band of survivors through a smoke-filled, terrifying landscape um, that's very reminiscent of the smoke-filled, terrifying landscape of the city of Troy as it's falling that Aeneas leads his band of survivors from. Um, and just like Aeneas, Pliny and his mother are motivated by family concerns. They're not rushing off hysterically, um, and they, in fact, don't try to leave the area. They're just getting out of the town. Um, and they don't want to leave because they don't know what's happened to Pliny the Elder. Um, and it's at this moment that the escape, again, very strongly recalls Aeneas's flight from Troy. So an important part of the story that Virgil tells um, about Aeneas is that Aeneas's father um, doesn't want to leave, and he urges his son to leave without him, to leave him to die, and Aeneas replies that no, they will leave together, or not at all. Not long after that, um, we get this famous image of Aeneas um, escaping from Troy with his father on his shoulder, as you can see there. And very much the same thing happens to Pliny. His mother wants him to leave her, but he won't. Um, and in, they continue on together, um, though slowly. And what he's doing there is displaying his pietas, um, his loyal duty to his family, that along with manly courage is one of the most important Roman values of them all. That's pretty much the, the climax of the second letter. Not very much happens subsequently. There are scenes of fear and confusion. Um, Pliny thinks that he's going to die, but he takes comfort in the thought that the world is ending, so everyone's dying. Um, and he and his mother eventually go back to Mycenaeum as the ash subsides, and they wait there um, in hope and in fear for news of what's happened to Pliny the Elder. So what then can we conclude from all of this? These letters are obviously um, fascinating, and parts of them are highly dramatic accounts of a major disaster, and they give us a very rare insight um, into a sort of a first-person narrative of what it was like to live through something like this 2,000 years ago. We might wish, as some scholars um, have, that they tell us a little bit more about practical details, but what we have, I think, is more interesting. Um, we have a window into what mattered in Pliny's world, which was taking your work, your intellectual pursuits, seriously, um, firstly. Secondly, helping your friends. Um, and thirdly, above all, being loyal to your family. So I leave you with an image 
that many of you may know, a Renaissance fresco from the Vatican, uh, showing Pope Leo IV miraculously extinguishing the flames um, that threatened an area of Rome near St. Peter's in the 9th century. But there in the foreground to the left, you can see Aeneas again escaping from Troy, see with his father on, on his back, um, and surrounded by his family, um, exactly the same image that Pliny used to show us what mattered to him during his escape from a conflagration um, as epic in its way as Troy continues to be used um, from ancient Rome into Renaissance Italy um, and indeed beyond. Thank you. Just um, a really, really interesting. I'm going to pass the, uh, the mic around for some, uh, some questions for 10 minutes. If, if that's all right, I think there'll be uh, probably a few questions. But um, if it's okay, I'm going to ask you one or two real quick, and then, then I'll pass it around. Um, so very interesting. I mean, why did it take so long for them to uncover the the actual ruins of Pompeii? Do you know why? You know, it, 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 hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Well, yeah, I mean, well over a thousand years. Um, it wasn't until 1748 that the um, excavations start seriously. Sorry, yeah. um, there, there was some digging before that. Was, um, there, are, there are early, much earlier tunnels that seem to have been dug by people who survived going back to try and get the stuff out. Right, yeah. um, but then you've got to remember this landscape, everything's covered by ash and pumice for miles and miles and miles. It must have been just like devastated. Yeah. Um, and although at about 100 years or so later there are little communities moving back, as obviously it's a very fertile area, partly because of the volcano, um, they just never, they never try and dig up the city um, and it takes, you know, uh, the enlightenment really for people to be interested in that kind well, of thing. Well, I guess the resources that they would have had to have to actually do it, yeah? Uh, because it was, it was buried how far under the ground? Uh, uh, look, Pompeii only about four meters, well, oh, only, oh, that's not, yeah, but, okay, but Herculaneum much, much deeper. Oh, right. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. It's amazing, and people still live there, it's amazing. Yeah. Because uh, it's still speaking, it's still very active. It, it's it's still an active volcano, this could happen again. I mean, it's probably just a matter of time. Yeah. Um, so anyway, thank you very much. So that's my question. <laughs> so, um, some questions, I'm sure. Uh, I'll pass the mic around with John. Um, a lot of the people here are uh, from the islands, the, the volcanic island, the Aeolian Islands, mm -hmm. and they've, history goes back about 5,000 years. Would that have been the time when those, those erupt there was an eruption at that time, uh, preceding what happened later, thousands of years later in uh, Pompeii? Because those are, uh, the islands are supposed to be volcanic eruptions, and one of them is called mm -hmm. Volcano, which is a, a yeah. steam volcano. And strongly, of course, still up for a away. Yes, yeah, look, there are, um, there are a number of active volcanoes in the area, and Etna, of course, as well. Um, and there, there's, in fact, there's, a, there's a, an epic poem written about Etna um, a, about 50 years after Vesuvius erupts. And, it, uh, and it sort of, it's, a, it's a very strange poem, and it sort of has some theories about what, what actually causes volcanic eruptions. And then it has a story about what people did when it there erupted one time in, around about this period as well. I have a question. This eruption that took place, to what extent did it extend from the actual volcano in miles away from the actual crater? Can you give me any idea as to um, how much of the okay. area was devastated? Let me go back to the map. Get that. Where is it? There we are. Okay, I've got the circle back for my team. Um, so what, what happened was um, that there were, I mean, obviously the pumice and ash and everything, that was falling at Mycenaeum. So that's a, f that's a fair way away, see, on the, on the little cape there at the end, and further away as well. The pyroclastic blasts then, um, they didn't extend so far. Um, the, they, the couple went down, just straight down towards the coast to Herculaneum. Herculaneum was hit several times, which is why it's buried so much deeper. And they actually went 
I gather, um, several miles out to see there's evidence that it just you know, kept going, the sea didn't stop it. Um, and then the second lot of pyroclastic busts kind of came this way down to Pompeii. So I, I'm very bad at sort of distances and <laughs> geography. I can't tell you in, kind of in, in kilometres or miles, but you can, you can sort of see the extent of it um, from there. But it all, it all came this way. I asked the question because of the fact that my grandfather was born in a little town called San Giuseppe Vesuviana, uh -huh. which is in very close proximity to Vesuvius, but I just don't know exactly how far away it is from Vesuvius. Have you heard of that town before? Um, I haven't, I'm afraid. I mostly know the names of the Roman towns and not the Italian ones. Um, but I wouldn't be at all surprised if that, that little settlement also was not affected by it. When you said that, um, that some people escaped the city of Pompeii, mm -hmm. where did they go? That's a, that's a really good question. Um, we think that some of them didn't go very far, so they just settled back in the general area. Um, but there's one man um, who ended up in Spain, and we know that because we've got his, his uh, gravestone. So he went a long way. Um, but <laughs> but most, most people didn't. Most people wouldn't have had the means um, to travel very far. Um, so, so they would just come back to the area, which must have been pretty scary for them, particularly if there were further earthquakes. Um, some would have gone elsewhere in Italy, like a bit further away, but most just hang around, hung around. Okay. So, so most of the people would have actually passed away because of the actual sulfur in the fumes, is that right? First, first that, of all. That's yeah, right. Because I went to Pompeii a couple of years ago, and uh, the thing that actually struck me was that uh, there's these uh, molds of uh, a few bodies lying on the ground. Explain that. Why? So that's what was it actually what happened to those? Yeah, well, what, what happens um, the, with those molds is um, the people have died either just because they can't breathe anymore um, because um, the air is too noxious or they're killed with, by the pyroclastic blast that just kind of vaporizes. Um, but the, particularly the ones who died earlier, they, you know, you fall. Where, where you were, and then you're covered up by the, the pumice, and so eventually the body kind of decomposes, but the shell and the skeleton is left, and then they fill those shells with um, resin or plaster of Paris, and you end up with a model of, of the people in their last moments. They're really very, very moving. Yeah. 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 Amazing, yeah. Okay. Um, I'll pass it around. Anyone else? Questions? <coughs> Tell us a little more about this and whether it has survived in, in the Mediterranean countries. Well, I think I mean La Familia is incredibly important still, right in, in Italy. Um, but for the ancient Romans, you have you have basically um, three duties. You have duty to the gods. You have a duty to your your patria, your your homeland, your your country, and you have a duty to your family. Um, and that's, I was talking about Aeneas, the hero and his pietas, um, that, that value, of the quality of pietas is something that along with, with courage um, and, and perhaps trustworthiness are uh, just the ideals. Um, so the Emperor Augustus, for example, when he wants to say what are the qualities that define him as a, a perfect Roman um, and therefore a, a natural leader for Rome, um, he blazons his own pietas and his own virtus, his courage, um, up on all of the monuments around. So it, it becomes, um, it's not just sort of culturally important in the stories that they tell about um, their founding heroes and, and people like 
Pliny the Younger in extreme situations, but almost institutionalized. Um, and then, and then of course, it, it evolves, I guess. The word then is where we get piety from, um, but that, in the modern sense, is much more your duty towards God than anything else. So how many people have actually lost in that eruption? They found about 650 bodies. Um, but between Pompeii in, and... Just in Pompeii. Just in, Her Pompeii. in Herculaneum, they recently found, um, I think, about 130 down in, um, in rooms sort of underground uh, near the, near the harbour. They think we're, we're waiting for a boat. They were ho everyone was hoping that the wind would change so they could sail off the coast, and it didn't. Um, so they found a couple of hundred there. Yeah. Uh, could you indicate on that map where Sorrento is? It's not Chern, <laughs> is it? I've got a feeling it's in the Bay of Naples somewhere. Who knows where Sorrento is? I know a place called Massa Lubrense is on the tip towards Capri. Mm -hmm. yes. Massa Lubrense is on that toe yes. section. Yes. And I think Sorrento's in the bay somewhere there. Right. Yeah. Uh, I've travelled from Naples to Sorrento mm -hmm. some years ago. It's a privately run railway system. Yeah. And uh, I recall going through that Herculaneum. Okay. I recall going through there. And uh, because I was in a strange area, I wasn't exactly sure where I was, but Sorrento was down the bottom there, and I stayed there for a little while, and went over to Capri, where a lot of people get a boat that goes across to Capri mm -hmm. to see the famous... Uh, the, the grotto. The grotto, and so forth. Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. That Virgil and Aeneas, is that the stuff that we used to learn in high school? Aeneas 3 and 4 and all that? Absolutely, yeah, that's well. Oh, jeez, if I'd realised at the time, I would be playing Lawson Crossing. <laughs> 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 oh, Can you tell us when Pompeii was started? Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> they think about 600 years BC. So it had been in existence for about 700 years when the eruption happened. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it had been, obviously, it started, started off fairly small and it had been growing. It was quite prosperous, they, they think, in the first century AD. Um, although there are some signs of um, neglect between um, between 62 when that big earthquake happened and then the eruption in 79. It looks like some people got out after the earthquake. <coughs> Was that the second biggest city in Rome? No, 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 not. Um, there, there would have been much larger cities um, to kind of to the north and, and closer to Rome. I mean, Naples was bigger than Pompeii. What about Benevento? I don't know about the relative <laughs> sizes of Benevento and, and Pompeii. Um, none of the cities were particularly big, apart it's from Rome. a huge Roman wall around yeah. a big amphitheatre, mm -hmm. so it must have been a fairly significant city. Yeah. Pompeii has, um, I mean, I'm sure many of you have been there, um, it's got a lovely, you know, theatre and, and uh, place for games and everything, it was, and they were, they were quite substantial, Ostia, um, you know, which is just at the mouth of the river Tiber down from Rome, it's got its own theatre too, so any, you're right, any, any town of significance would have a theatre. I wonder what escape plans are in place today if Mount Vesuvius decides to yeah. show her fury. I don't know, but I'm sure that they are. Um, I'd be keeping a very wary eye on <laughs> in the clouds myself. Yeah. We'll be having a bath, I don't think. No, <laughs> no that's extraordinary. Yeah. Okay, any, any other questions? Okay, cool. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Girl. So this is the time where we invite Dr. Dr. to come and sit on the lounge and do 